Good morning and welcome to our teaching session today. Uh, we're going to be diving into Hebrews chapter 10. So if you've got your Bibles open, really good to have it ready. Um, and we're going to do that reading in a minute, but I'm just going to pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the richness of your word. Thank you for uh, the many treasures that are in here that reveal uh, your not only your truth, but Lord, what our lives should be in reflection of who you are and what you've done for us. We pray, Lord, that the encouragement of your word may stir richly in our hearts and that we would be blessed by you again, drawn closer to you, Lord, may, made more known of, Lord, your heart for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to go to Hebrews 10 and we're going to read from uh, verses 11 and down to verse 25. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when the pre this priest, Jesus, had offered all for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he is made perfect for though ever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them, that after that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, for their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is now no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who, who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. Well, these are great words, aren't they, for us to uh, consider and think about this morning. But as we've gone through this whole letter of the Hebrews, it's been written to a church that is... Um, really suffering, they're going through difficult times and they're facing daily struggles. All the time they're going through the different aspects of uh, persecution and just trying to figure out what their living situation and what it means to be a Christian in their current context is like. And as they're doing that, what's naturally happening is they're questioning and saying, well, what's this Christian faith really about? You know, is it worth it? Can we not go back to what we once knew for those who are Jewish Christians? And the writer is aware of, of the situation and the questions they face and so responds in two clear ways. Firstly, he focuses upon right from the beginning who the person of Jesus is and the work of Jesus and how relevant that is and crucial to the challenges and questions they face. But then he adds on this second layer that follows immediately afterwards, that because of Jesus, because of who he is and the importance of what he has done, we have this real hope. And in fact, in our series, we've already explored two aspects of this hope. In chapter six, towards the end, we uh, picked up, didn't we, on the fact that we have this hope that is an anchor. And we talked about Jesus rests in heaven like an anchor that goes down into the depths. Uh, of, and there's this place where it is held secure, is where Jesus is in heaven. But yet, like the rope coming back to the ship into the other place that is on earth for us, 
coming back to us, that we know that we have this, this line, this connection of hope that holds us in the here and now. But then in chapter 11, we uh, looked at towards the end, uh, Easter time, and we looked at what it meant to have this resurrection hope, how it holds us, uh, both in triumph, but in the suffering as well. And that because of this real resurrection hope, because of this tangible hope, we know that death no longer reigns and we know that our bodies and life will be remain remade. So we have uh, no need to fear. And then we come to this passage and we come to this point where in verses 11 to 18, it's almost like a summary. It's, it's getting to this great crescendo saying that, yes, Jesus is our better high priest. And because Jesus is our better high priest, he's also our better sacrifice. And as well as being our better sacrifice, we have these better promises, as he quotes from Jeremiah again. And he's, he's doing that all before he launches into verses 19 to 25. And these amazing verses saying, listen, because of this work, because of this Jesus, launches into what it means to be a people who live in hope. What does the life of hope as a Christian community look like in challenging times? And today I want to pick up on what the life of that community looks like. But then also, uh, what is it that we, where, where is it we draw our power from? What are the things that we draw our power from? So we're looking at what the life of the community looks like. And then where is it it draws its power as we look at our uh, Bibles, and if you look at verse 25, the word for meeting together um, used in the original Greek is uh, episynagogue. And that's the word where obviously synagogue comes from. But essentially, it's not just about a, a group of people who um, come together. It's a group of people who are more like a, I guess a good picture is a bunch of grapes. And that obviously conjures up images of Jesus saying, I am the vine and you are the fruit. And uh, when we think about that and what Jesus uh, is, is saying and what we think about what it means to be a church, the picture is being painted that the church is a people whose lives flow together. You know, we don't just come to a Sunday service, hear a sermon and go our separate ways. And actually, in the, the book of Hebrews, if you uh, look at the term that is used here and going onwards, in the other chapters after this, it, that idea is reinforced by the words one another. In fact, it's just one word in the Greek. But in the Greek, the, the phrase or the word one another means mutuality. You know, we share together as God's people. We bear things together. Our lives cross over. And so perhaps we understand a little bit more of what the writer is saying when he sits there and says, don't give up meeting together. He's not just talking about Sunday services. He's talking about flowing into each other. You know, don't give up that flow of coming together. And our lives, as they flow into each other, and as we think about that sort of steady stream coming together, we flow to somewhere, don't we? And in the Old Testament, the, the people once a year understood that sense of where we flow towards because they would come into the uh, presence of God and in a unique way, once a year, Yom Kippur, um, they would experience that forgiveness and grace of God in order to draw near again and to worship him. And that was to be transformed by God's presence, to be in, in living in that knowledge of his love for them. And so when the writer talks at the beginning of, of verses 19 to 22 about the truth of being able to draw near at any moment because of Jesus, He's saying we, we enter in just like the Old Testament people of God. We enter into this place of transformation into the presence of God. That's where we flow to meet face to face with Jesus, to be forgiven together, accepted, to be loved, to be renewed and, and to have our lives changed as we understand that immense gift and value of what Jesus has given. I know in my own life that when I connect and really ponder that gift of God, 
um, it, it not only inspires me to, to worship, but also just to press in that little bit further to allow the wonder and the mystery to really flow into my whole being. And when we come into the presence of God and we do that and we dwell richly on this great gift that God has given us in Jesus to come into his presence freely, to know that, that confidence of access, when you put yourself in that place, being in God's presence changes who we are. And I know that. I, you know, I know when I spend time with the Lord and I'm in his presence, I, I'm able to be more patient. I know when I think about the grace that's been given me, I'm able to be a bit more gracious with others. I also find my heart expanding and just being able to love to a greater capacity. Well, the rest of this passage connects what we call the vertical of our relationship with God with the horizontal of our relationship with others. In other words, if you want to know the true nature of church, what it's really about, what its life is about, it is found through accessing the presence of God coming together with others. And here the implication is that true worship is found not so much on your own in your bedroom, but in the company of others, accessing together this transformative power of God radiating through our lives, allowing that crossover and flow together. It's not to say that our quiet times aren't important, but there's something about just entering into that flow together. And what the writer does is he highlights there are four things in which we can engage with that as we uh, experience that that presence that life of the community and he highlights four particular things he talks about considering spurring on encouraging and doing things and um i want to give some practical examples of of, uh, of just one of those things as we continue to think about the life of the church a life in hope and what it means and I want to pick up on um, the word he, he uses here of stirring up or spurring one another on. Actually, in the Greek, it means to sharply disagree. Now, we can sit there and think, well, you know, does that mean I have license to go around and um, uh, freely air my thoughts and opinions to others? Uh, well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't mean you can sit there and say, I've got a spiritual gift of spurring on, so let me tell you all the things I don't like about you. And there are probably individuals that we can think of in our experience, whether in growing up in church life or at work, that um, probably feel that they have that gift of um, sharply disagreeing. But thankfully, it means a lot more here. What it means is it's like this. It's, it's, uh, let me paint a picture for you. Um, I remember watching the 2012 Olympics and Michael Johnson was, uh, or he is a, a double gold medal champion in, and he won his medals in 2004. And he was there in 2012 at London on the BBC as a pundit. And he was saying what made him a, a champion, what enabled him to get over um, that line of being the best was that he went to his coach and he just said, coach, I want you to tell me everything that I'm doing wrong and every area where I need to improve. And he said to him, everything, coach, not just my techniques, but my character and desire, because I want to be enabled to be the best athlete I can be. And being someone who spurs others on is leading people into the presence of God so that you may be transformed to become all that God intended you to be or intended them to be. And so we don't criticize for the sake of it. We hold up that gospel lens, everything through what Jesus has said and done and through his death and resurrection. And we say, through this, through this framework, through this lens, in encountering God's presence together, uh, this is how I, I, I want to see those around me to be. And that's really, it's about challenging people through that framework of, of people being all that we can be in living under the cross. And, you know, there have been occasions when I've had to challenge people who 
you know, typically have led worship and we have those moments where uh, they've been asked to come along and maybe it's the first time or uh, maybe there are a few in and they're getting used to it and they start off by saying, you know, well, Dave has asked me to lead worship and, uh, you know, I'm not sure why he's asked me and this probably is not going to be that good and I won't do this again. Uh, and people do that as a way of, don't they, that, that sort of feel the, the, the sense of fear and perhaps being inadequate. But often when I hear that, I want to go up and I do go up to people afterwards and I say, listen, don't put yourself down. Don't point people towards yourself at the beginning, but be confident in how God sees you. Start off with that sense of you've been given a gift and you're more valued than anything else and actually proclaim that value and give thanks to him because it's an opportunity whenever you're up front, isn't it, to allow people to see that work of God in you. And the life of the church, for me, is always about family that desires the best of each other and desires the best in how we understand ourselves, trying to help people, not just in self-understanding, but even in some of those crucial areas of challenging and spurring one another on in how we spend our money, in the way that we relate to other people. And I know today we're in lockdown and everything is separated and we think, well, we're not together. How can we spur one another on? But I think there are still opportunities if we are in that flow and communicating together that as we hear each other talk, you know, do we challenge each other about our attitude, about whether or not we are being gloomy about things, negative? You know, spurring one another on is actually taking that gospel framework and, and gently saying to people, actually, there's more hope out there. You know, God is with us in this. And that sense of, of spurring people to be more than they can be through the words they say and the thoughts that they have. And that's different from encouragement. I think encouragement is about stepping into people's shoes and, and giving them uh, strength to, to persevere and to keep going but spurring is I think leading people into the presence of God and seeing what it's like to uh, make others help others to be more like Jesus and I think that's what families are being church family is about and perhaps you know, it's a challenge for us. Are we willing in those moments when we hear people talk to speak into other people's lives? Well, perhaps the lockdown is a good excuse to walk away from that willingness and you know, just saying, well, it's, it's a difficult time. I won't challenge them now. I wonder if lockdown for some of us is an opportunity just to, well, I'm going into just a survival mode. I'm going to be an island. And actually... I won't even invite people to speak into my life. I think when we shut ourselves down and we don't even allow the opportunity for people to speak to us, to spur us on or to challenge us, and we're not even open to uh, that sense of growing, um, people putting their finger on things in love, I think if we do that, then it's not a true reflection of church more a reflection on loneliness because actually when you don't allow people to speak into your life who you trust and who are around you that you build relationship with then you don't allow people to actually love you and I think true life excels when we're in relationships that allow others to really care for us so much so that they can see they want to see more of Jesus in us and when we allow that to happen, then there's a real flow coming together, an acceptance of, uh, of each other as well. Well, the other aspect that I wanted to pick up on today was where is it as a community that lives in hope? Do we draw our power? What's the tangible things that we can really hook on that, uh, that builds us up, that gives us that, that spiritual energy? and delight in God. And I think it's the question that the writer is asking here, how does a true community thrive when it's in a challenging time? 
And I think in verses 19 to 22, we, we have just such a profound answer. These verses are often recognized as the assurance verses. And in fact, when you look at the meaning of verse 9, when it's by verse 19, it, it picks up on the strength of that assurance. When you look at the word confidence, and uh, earlier on in Hebrews, it's, it's the same thing that's been picked up on uh, again and again in the book. But the word confidence here means to speak freely. Now, my kids, they know that they can speak freely with me because they have confidence in our relationship that nothing changes because of what they say. Doesn't mean I let them get away with saying absolutely anything without challenging them, but they know that there's a freedom to express and uh, to just talk what they're thinking, express what they're thinking. And it's that kind of confidence that kind of confidence that's meant here is to be without second guessing, not carefully treading over my thoughts or questions and, you know, in my own mind as I'm speaking, is this OK? Is this coming out all right? You know, like we do as adults in our everyday conversations, but we're constantly weighing things up. And whereas a child just comes in and just says it. They've got full confidence just to speak it out. And, and that's the confidence here. It's it's so confident of what jesus has done i don't even need to think about it it just it is it's just out there i can just speak freely and that confidence is the knowledge that my sins have been forgiven i'm clean in the presence of god and when we think about what that means for a community living in hope it means that on a mutual level that everyone is on the inside that everyone has that confidence that everyone is together in that most intimate place with God. You know, it's true, isn't it? I remember when I was in the workplace in London and I first started off, we all want to, you know, we all sort of identify who the people are within that sort of group. And it may be a different social setting. But you, you try and work out who the key players are, who are the popular people and who are not so popular. Who are those who sort of drift in between? And we all do that at a particular level. But what we're really looking out for are who are the people who matter? Who is it that I want to be on the inside with where everything is being joked about, laughed about and talked about, where I can be on the inside of that? And our desire often to be on the inside of things often means that we think about our relationships, about not what I, or not who I can love for their sake, but who can I love for my sake? What can I get out of this? And our desire to be on the inside actually can become corrosive. You know, it robs that power of, of love and valuing people around us. But true power comes when we know that we are so accepted that we're on the inside. Because when we know we're on the inside and we're with the person who matters most, and in this case it's Jesus, then we're free to love people not for our sake but for their sake. And I just wonder, can you imagine a community of people like that? People who feel like they're on the inside and love people, not for your sake, not for my needs, but for theirs. And that's what assurance does. That's what the work of Jesus does. That's what these verses speak about, that powerful sense of being right there in the presence of God on the inside. To imagine a community of people like that is amazing. But it's something I believe that Jesus imagined and saw when he died on the cross, when he was rejected, when he was isolated, when he was on the outside. He did all that so that we could be on the inside, so that we could be empowered to be a people who live richly in this hope. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be so blessed 
with that sense of assurance in you that it would just flow from our hearts. Lord, in the desire to love others and to lead them, to stir others up, to be all that they can be in your presence. We thank you for the power of being with you. And Lord, as we face our current situation, as we are in a tough time, Lord, in lockdown and facing restrictions and being apart in one sense, we pray that we may know the strength of being bound together in that love of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, have a blessed day and God bless you all.